I fell in love with Russia when I first visited in the 1980s as a schoolboy. There was something epic about it. It was the Soviet Union then. Its government claimed to be leading humanity to a brighter future where all people would be equal. The changes since the fall of communism have been equally epic. Today, Moscow has more billionaires than any other city on the planet. But just as Russia seems to be catching its breath after all those changes, it turns out it's facing a hidden crisis. In the first six months of 2005, Russia's population fell by half a million. According to the government's own statistics, by 2050, it could lose up to half of its people. The trouble is that Russia combines a, a developed world birth rate with a third world mortality rate. Life expectancy here is 56 for men, which is the same as Bosnia or Bangladesh. And the rise in mortality here over the last 10 years is unprecedented in a developed country. It's as though the country is, is at war. The end of communism took away everything this country was supposed to stand for. Now a new nation is emerging. I wanted to see if I could find out what kind of place it's becoming and why its people are dying in such numbers. My search took me through Russia's least reported territories to see what's become of its citizens. My name is Boris Dobryakov. Welcome, Ivanova. Мы текстильный град. Нас называли русский Манчестер. When communism collapsed, it hit places like Ivanova particularly hard. The central planners had decreed that this would be the textile center of the whole Soviet Union. Now half the mills are closed, and two thirds of the population live on less than 60 pounds a month. The plan was that by brutalizing the economy in this way, you know, from 1991 onwards, having economic reform, throwing people out of work, that it would, a Darwinian process would occur where the fittest, the economically fittest would survive. Gradually, economic success would spread through the country and re-employ all the people who'd been thrown out of work. Well, it's 15 years later, you know. Poland's now a member of the EU. And where's Russia? This place looks like it's, uh, it looks like a bomb hit it in 1991 and everyone went away. For 70 years, the state employed and housed every citizen. It may not have provided freedom, but it offered its people a sense of direction. Most Russian people had become pretty skeptical about the promises of communism by the time it ended. But after 1991, tens of millions were abandoned to the most brutal effects of the free market. Astonishingly, the average life expectancy for a Russian man dropped by seven years. Volodya and Tanya have been homeless for five years. He's 44 years old, she's 37. Bolodya 
But the root of the demographic crisis is not just the fact that people are dying. It's also that Russians aren't having enough children. Last year, President Putin came to Ivanova to open a brand new maternity hospital and admitted that the demographic crisis was threatening the survival of the nation. The government's even resorted to offering people extra benefits to encourage them to have big families, an old Soviet tactic. The birth rate's barely half what it needs to be to keep the population stable. And that's only part of the problem. Times have been too hard for many Russians to start a family. Abortions outnumber live births. And thanks to ill health, 10 million Russians are infertile. Если говорить по женщинам, то здесь это инфекция, а во многом это проблемы планирования семьи. Согласны? То есть это непланируемые и нежелательные беременности, это аборты, это раннее начало половой жизни. Мы вообще говорим, что у нас проблема со здоровьем населения России. Почему сейчас президент и говорит приоритет здравоохранения? Так нельзя. Здоровье особенно родившихся детей. As I left Ivanova, I felt I'd seen few of the supposed advantages of the free market. And worse, it seemed to me that the dying population was evidence of a deeper sense of hopelessness. I wondered what had happened that people had grown reluctant to have children, and some even seemed to have lost the will to survive. This is Moscow, once the HQ of the global class struggle, now capital of the Russian good life. The rest of the country has watched in disbelief. Vast fortunes have collected in the hands of a very few people. It may not be fair, but life here appears undeniably better than it used to be. Vladimir Panin is one of the success stories. In Soviet times, he was a doctor in accident and emergency. Now he's Moscow's biggest undertaker. His business has an official annual turnover of close to 100 million pounds. В 87 году, когда такая возможность реально получилась зарабатывать деньги, то и было принято решение уйти в бизнес. В бизнес слово в то время не очень может быть понятное для всех россиян. Но во всяком случае, оно уже было на слуху. Business in Russia soon came to mean a violent free for all, where the most successful had to ally themselves with a homegrown criminal mafia. Голос специфического тембра попросил назначить ему встречу. Каков повод нашей встречи? При встрече ты узнаешь, сказал он мне, переходя на ты. Я понял, что я общаюсь с преступными, с представителями преступного клана, одного из кланов, которые уже тогда зарождались по России, да и в общем-то и по Москве их было много. funeral business, weirdly enough, you wouldn't think it, but it's rife with criminality. In fact, it unofficially shares third place with sex trafficking, just behind the arms trade and drug trafficking. Uh, last year, Panin's bodyguard and his driver were killed and his car was shot up. So, um, you know, it's, it's the, the, the rewards are huge, but the risks are equally huge. Это были и смерти, это были и пытки, это были и утюги, раскаленные утюги, которые приставлялись к телу. Это были и паяльники. Все, что угодно. Все, что угодно было, чтобы застращать, чтобы подмять под себя, чтобы получить деньги с новых кооператоров. Сказать, что мы не платили деньги, что мы не испугались, этого не могу. Испуг был, потому что у нас не было еще иной поддержки. Обращаться в правоохранительные органы в милиции было себе дороже. It's said that there are profits to be made from um, 
and this is hard to believe, but from selling body parts, that there's a, there's a brisk trade in eyes and in skeletons. Насколько это этично или неэтично, если вы спросите, я вам скажу, а насколько дорога была мне жизнь моя и моих сотрудников? Наверное, это будет ответом на все вопросы касательно этики и морали. There seems to be a kind of eternal Russian way of doing things which still obtains, you know, that and the more you hear about it, the there's constantly surprises that, that on the surface there have been these impressive changes and underneath there's a deep trough of corruption. Most Russians got left behind while a handful of people with the right connections swallowed up state assets that once belonged to everyone. They became known as oligarchs and Sergei Veremienko's one of them. He was a humble geologist in Soviet times now he's worth $500 million. Verimyenko recently acquired 400 acres of land here on the outskirts of Moscow from a group of former collective farm workers and paid them next to nothing. He plans to turn it into prime real estate. Sergei built this church from scratch. Like many of Russia's new rich, he's keen to put the injustices of the past behind him. Since becoming a multimillionaire, Sergei Veremyenko has found religion. He says he got, he got um, baptized when he was 20. Yeah. Veremyenko says God told him to build a church here. He's building another 30 all over Russia, perhaps to ease the pain of his impoverished fellow citizens. А вы мне объяснили, что Бог знает, Бог поминает то, что человек делает в жизни, и потом после. Мы надеемся на это. Думаем, что это так. Да, ибо, конечно, вера только в этом утверждается. Сергей Алексеевич, в первую очередь, это же все храм, это все для народа, правильно? Это в первую очередь подарок народу. Здесь ворота открыты для всех. Кто у кого есть желание, пожалуйста, придут, молиться и все смотрит. I then learned that Veremyenko has plans to use this land to make him even more money. He wants to turn these fields into a golf course and build a marina for rich people like him. But there are others who have lived here for years who are standing in the way of the project. Andrei Smirnov was an officer in the Russian Navy. Now he's an interpreter for foreign businessmen. He owns a summer house on the lake here and Veremyenko wants to get rid of it. What we observe even in the, in the neighborhood is the people who have, uh, one way or another, got hold of the land, they are now getting positions in the local administration. So they're the power, they're the authorities, and they've got the land. Now, and who is the rest of us? What, new Russian serfs? Shortly after Verimenka bought the land here, Smirnov and his neighbours were told that their homes were illegal and ordered to demolish them. They began fighting the decision in the courts when suddenly they were raided by the anti-terrorist police. Smirnov's brother-in-law filmed this. Two houses were demolished. Men and women were handcuffed and beaten. You can imagine that against a couple of dozen kids and a couple of dozen old ladies, there was uh, almost a battalion of uh, people, you know, in masks, in camouflage, with submachine guns, with truncheons, you know, storming the houses. Uh, a, raid, a raid like this would have been appropriate against you know, terrorists or you know, gangsters, but not against uh, peaceful citizens. When the footage was shown on TV, it seemed to confirm people's worst suspicions, that the state was aligning itself with the rich and powerful against Russia's ordinary citizens. 
In the 90s, one had to be utterly unscrupulous and very fast. What is now is changed. Uh, one really has to be in power, you know, one of the ranks of power. One has to be a bureaucrat to really feel safe about his uh, acquired wealth or to amass new wealth. Сергей Веременко, 48 лет, русский, кандидат в президенты Республики Башкортостан, известный бизнесмен, представитель президента. The new rich are attempting to turn themselves into politicians. Веременко recently ran for control over a whole Russian region. After the first round of voting, Veremenko looked set to defeat his opponent. But at the last minute, President Putin openly backed the other candidate, and Veremenko discovered the new limits of what money can buy in today's Russia. Олигарх Веременко хоть и вышел, но сразу после этого становиться президентом Башкирии расхотел. Повесил на двери штаба замок и уехал в Москву. Уже оттуда он призвал тех, кто за него голосовал, больше этого не делать. Ничего похожего, мировая избирательная практика, похоже, еще не знала. Не хочу скрывать от своих избирателей, сейчас ведутся активные консультации о моей работе, что не дает мне возможности работать в республике. Именно поэтому я принял решение приостановить свою кампанию. We were told that just before making this statement, Veremenko was hauled in before Putin and told to withdraw from the election. Veremenko's aides say that Putin had threatened to send him to prison. This is what Putin calls managed democracy. And Veremenko's adapting rather well to it. What? 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 Since the Bashkiria campaign, he's remarried. And now he's using his new wife to pursue his political ambitions. She said she got interested a year ago and now she's been interested for a whole year. And 23 года. А самый молодой глава администрации, самый молодой, наверное, в России в Московской области точно. В России. В России. Самый молодой. Сам самый молодая. Самый молодая, да. Ну, народ доверился. Народ избрал. Конечно. И поэтому будем стараться, будем работать. Поздравляю. Спасибо. <laughs> President Putin is once again centralizing power in the Kremlin. Oligarchs have been reined in, some even imprisoned. Democratically elected governors have been deposed. TV stations and newspapers brought under control. Surprisingly, for a man who says he's a reformer, President Putin has described the collapse of the Soviet Union as the greatest social catastrophe of the 20th century. He's determined to restore a sense of national pride to fill the hole left by the end of communism. Slava Russia! Hurra! It appears that many of the new generation, too young actually to have experienced life under communism, have responded to his call. Nashi is a pro-Putin youth movement set up to restore a sense of national purpose and denounce the president's enemies. Наша так называемая оппозиция, если говорить про так называемую демократическую и либеральную часть, они готовы пожертвовать целостностью страны ради своих демократических идей. Демократия очень важна, но не в угоду целостности государства. В 99 году очень многие сомневались, что Россия до 2002 доживет целой. Она дожила и продолжает существовать. На Западе многие сомневаются, что Путин идет путем демократизации. Мне не кажется, что это что его политика это уход в авторитаризм. Вы просто заболеете за правительство. Нет. 
У меня очень много претензий к правительству. Мы болеем за страну. Я думаю, что Россия сейчас в опасности. И мы делаем все, чтобы ее от этой опасности оградить и вывести на более высокий уровень. What is the danger? Какая опасность? В чем опасность? А опасность с разных сторон. Опасность э, развала, потому что страна очень большая. И как произошло с СССР в 1991 году, то же самое всегда может произойти и в России. Russia's new patriotism is meant to keep the country together, but it seems to be having the opposite effect. We traveled to Krasnodar on Russia's southern border, where we found the new nationalism is driving an entire nation into exile. Despite the country's dwindling population, the federal government has refused to recognize the Meshket Turks as Russian citizens. Soon there won't be any left. I'd been invited to a party being held by a Meshket who was leaving the next day for Buffalo, New York. I was astonished to find that the USA is taking all 30,000 of them and giving them American residence on humanitarian grounds. It's very strange. Russia desperately needs people, but not, apparently, these ones. Вот за людей посчитали, приняли нас, хотя мы им, мы для них никакой пользы не сделали, для Америки той, хотя мы для России пользы делали, мы им не нужны здесь, а для Америки ничего абсолютно, мы никакой пользы не делали, но они нас принимают, видите, как люди. Для всей России, не то чтобы для всей России, какой-то народ, не народ, а звери как-то получаемся, понимаете? Еще и был передача, что по передаче также говорили, что надо до последнего выдворить, а косса мы плодимся. Как ролики. Да. Они вот их как надо давить сказать. и давить. Вот. Our conversation with the women was interrupted when some men in uniforms suddenly arrived. They said they'd been looking for us all over town and that we were in serious trouble. They wanted to see me and the producer outside. Krasnodar was a dangerous place, they said, and we needed their protection. And filming with the Turks was not allowed. Передайте вашему господину, чтобы он... А что, я не понял, мы как... Вам обидели, а? Не обидели. А что, в чем дело тогда? Мне кажется, что... Ты лично на меня обижаешься. У них есть свой план, они сейчас хотели снимать людей, которые... У вас нет плана, у вас уже нет плана. He wanted us to get in his car and go and, and um, go somewhere unspecified with him. They said they were Cossacks, and from now on we had to do what they wanted. They told us the last journalists who refused their protection disappeared. They were found days later, decapitated, and left by the roadside. I'd come to Krasnodar in southern Russia and things had got out of hand. We'd been kidnapped by a Cossack called Victor. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, it, might, it might not be that smart. We didn't know what he was going to do to us and I was petrified. He made us drive on all afternoon. Victor said we were going to learn what Cossacks were made of. Then we reached his shop and he got the beers out. He wanted us to drink with him and his henchmen and sing Cossack songs. It was like being cornered by the local nutters in the pub. Before becoming a grocer, Victor served in the Soviet army as a border guard. 
He joined the Cossacks in the late 1990s and was about to be made a colonel or ataman. Victor had been drinking solidly for the past two days, celebrating. This is his third pint in half an hour. The more he drank, the more he seemed to forget his previous dislike of us. It felt like we were beginning to get the upper hand. Okay. I'm very comfortable here. I feel very comfortable with you. I don't know. I want to tell you all my secrets. The drinking session dragged on into the evening until Victor finally passed out. But the next morning he was there waiting for us. So we went to the local Cossack headquarters to try to get him off our backs. Victor's boss insisted that we drink some moonshine. And half a bottle later, Victor took his revenge when another Cossack got the whip out. He wants me to be whipped, but I'm not, you know, I'm not going to be whipped. My religion forbids it. My religion forbids it. My religion well, we can whip the director. It's your on-camera moment, dude. I don't know. A lot of people want to whip. That was horrible. You just you ripped хотел... the director, I can't fucking believe it. Хотел обмануть, обмануть хотел Петра Первого. The director got whipped. He взял вина, вина он взял слабенького. Let's read, let's just chill and read a bit of... I, I'm enough of the violence, man. Let's just read the book. Let's just read to it. Ah, mine come. Mine come. So last night, Victor said that he'd personally captured two Turks who raped a local Russian woman. Uh, and he captured them without the knowledge of the local police. And he was going to deal with them in his own way, i.e. give them a good beating, which he would supervise. So that was our introduction to Krasnodar. That same day, we filmed Victor's church blessing as he was officially made an ataman. From now on, he'd have hundreds of paramilitaries under his command. I do feel like with talking to Victor, I feel like I'm talking to a Nazi, 1933. He's a self-avowed kind of Russian supremacist. He hates blacks, he hates these... Turks who've wound up on his territory and and you know in, mo in most you know if you met him in a pub in London you'd just think he was just like a laughable racist he's got a uniform and a gun you know how terrifying is that the Cossacks now operate as a parallel police force in these areas they go on raids against the local Muslim population, who they accuse of harboring criminals and terrorists from neighboring Chechnya. The Cossacks see this as a return to their historic role as the protectors of Mother Russia. Their brand of religious nationalism was heresy in the old Soviet Union. Now they have two armed brigades in the Russian army and serve as Putin's ceremonial bodyguards. Ivan Bazugli, the commander-in-chief of the Krasnodar region, has 48,000 men under his command. Ну, известно, как 
Сегодня также живем в дружбе со всеми национальностями Северного Кавказа. Хотя есть у нас вот проблема была и сегодня еще остается с нашими, так сказать, друзьями, которые сюда заехали. Хотя им тут делать нечего было, мы их сюда не приглашали. Они тут насиловали наших женщин, они насиловали наших детей, в том числе и мальчиков, что на Кубани никогда в казачестве это не было такого. Они размножаются, не дай бог. Вот я специально пошел в роддом. Из 10 человек один два русских, остальные все турки, там, другие, другие национальности. От этого не уйдешь. От этого не уйдешь, если оно уменьшается, если русский народ вымирает сегодня. Finally, we escaped the attentions of the Cossacks and secretly went back to see the Meshket Turks. They first came here as refugees in the 1990s when the Soviet Union broke up. But the authorities in Krasnodar didn't want them. Jobs are denied to them and they found it harder and harder to survive. Жить нормально не дают, да, сразу приходят штраф, давайте платите, нельзя торговать. Говорят, что турков, мисхотинцев, ни один Краснодарского края, чтобы не остался в Краснодарском крае, ни один турков, мисхотинцев. Это кубанцы место, русские должны жить. Даже еще, да. Не хотим, не хотим. Они не мама остается. Мы сколько лет жили? Теперь, когда я американский язык знаю. I I don't want to go to America. I know this language. It's almost like the message is that 21st century Russia does not welcome people who don't look like us. You know that. It, it, it's a it's a very harshly nationalistic message. That Russia is for the Russians. A new Meshkets can go away. Once the people have entered that mindset where these aliens are living on their land and they're rapists and, you know, everything is possible, you know, it feels like the next step is concentration camps, doesn't it? It does to me, anyway. I left Krasnodar feeling that it was more like Germany in the 1930s than the Russia I expected to see in 2005. My journey then took me from the southern borders to Siberia, Russia's vast geographical heart. This is the city of Irkutsk. It's one of the transit points for heroin from Afghanistan and the unofficial AIDS capital of Russia. Until 1998, less than 50 people were HIV positive here. Then in the spring of 1999, doctors started diagnosing dozens of new cases every day. Now they count the infected in thousands. Andrei Artyomenko was one of the first to be tested. А какая реакция у тебя была, когда ты узнал, что ВИЧ позитивный? Ну, такая двоякая. С одной стороны, страх, растерянность и боль. С другой стороны, какая-то гордость, что я чем-то отличаюсь от других людей. Ну, вот, гордость? Ну, сложно сказать. Ну, какое-то такое похожее состояние, что да, вот... Мне хотелось как-то вот, может быть, сгладить вот эту боль. Эта эпидемия начиналась, и люди не знали, что это такое. Они боялись. 
вашей, в твоих друзей сколько примерно? Какие, ну, какие из проценты? моего, я могу сказать, что с 20, из 25 человек из класса пятеро, пятеро. стали наркоманы. И еще 10 стали алкоголиками. 10? Да. Это я могу однозначно сказать. Если раньше вспомнить был э, социализм, коммунизм, нас вели к светлой жизни. Ну, при этом, когда э, была перестройка, коммунизм ушел в небытие, да, разбилось все, на, на, расчленилось на разные государства и так далее. В глобальном масштабе люди утратили цель. Их просто взяли и толкнули. Живите, как хотите. С одной стороны, вроде бы дали свободу, но эта свобода оказалась иллюзорной. И что, де что делает правительство, чтобы помочь те, которые видят пози позитивные? Я не знаю, что делает правительство. Видимо, оно ничего не делает. Они не видят ее вот с этой стороны, как видят ее э, люди, живущие с ВИЧ-спидом, как видят ее э, представители некоммерческого сектора, потому что они как бы варятся в этом соку, они варятся в этой проблеме. И час, чаще всего деньги уходят просто в трубу. Андрей now does yoga in the hope that it will help prolong his life. But if he doesn't get any proper treatment, he's unlikely to survive much longer. The Russian government has been reluctant to acknowledge that Russia is facing an AIDS crisis. But the disease has crossed a crucial threshold that means it could quickly spread through the rest of the population. If it continues unchecked, it could be a catastrophe. AIDS has entered Russia's bloodstream and is set to become an epidemic. This is a drug rehab center on the outskirts of Irkutsk in Siberia, where the disease has reached critical levels. In the whole of Irkutsk, just 25 people are being given antiretrovirals. Over 17,000 are HIV positive. По официальным данным, один из 15-18 молодых людей вич инфицирован. А если говорить о реальных цифрах, то я думаю, что это где-то один из пяти. В самом начале эпидемии в основном это был внутривенный путь распространения. И вот последние данные, там более 25% вновь ВИЧ инфицированных, инфекция была половым путем. Мы сейчас находимся в стадии эпидемии в такой, когда еще распространяется инфекция по различным целевым группам. И идет рост числа вич и так далее. Но я думаю, что мы столкнемся с очень большими проблемами, когда э, нужно будет э, ВИЧ-инфицированных лечить. Эта эпидемия и Иркутская, и Иркутская область полыхает в этом отношении, в отношении ВИЧ. The first official AIDS case in the Soviet Union was in 1988. It was reported in the papers and made it very clear that the woman was a Leningrad prostitute and stressed the number of her foreign African clients. From the beginning, AIDS was seen as, a, as an African disease, as, as a disease of the degenerate capitalist West, but not as a Soviet disease. And that attitude still lingers today. It seems that the government's been too proud to ask for any international assistance. Instead, it's pledged to spend five times more fighting the disease in Africa than it spends at home on its own people. Russia's unique situation is that it's got a declining population and an exploding AIDS problem. So HIV AIDS just compounds everything about the demographic crisis. And the tragedy of HIV AIDS here in Irkutsk is that it's predominantly a disease of the young. It's a disease of the, of the population that has the most relevance to the workforce. It's the disease of Russia's future.
if nothing will be done, about uh, 15 million people will die in in nearest 25 years. Vadim Pokrovsky has been warning of the catastrophic consequences of AIDS for Russia since the disease first surfaced. He's been in charge of the AIDS program since Soviet times, but been left powerless to prevent its spread. The latest uh, Soviet budget in the year 1991 was approximately two to three uh, billion US dollars. And the Russian federal budget for the year 2005 is only five million dollars. It's enough only to treat uh, at least 500 patients. And we have 300,000 patients. The disease has moved on from junkies and prostitutes into the wider community. Within the next two to three years, Pokrovsky expects the death toll to reach 100,000. You've been warning about HIV AIDS for 15 years. You've been telling people that it's a huge problem. The problem now is worse than it's ever been, and it's set to get even worse. The problem is psychological, because at the moment in Russia, only several thousand people had died because of HIV infection. Only when 100,000 people will die, everybody will understand that it is a real danger for Russia. According to the World Bank's most optimistic estimates, Russia will have a quarter of a million AIDS deaths a year by 2020. Well, Russia's facing a calamity. Nowhere in the world is there an AIDS crisis of this magnitude in a population that's already declining. And yet, for the first time since the fall of communism, the Russian government's got the means to do something about it. At the moment, there are a lot of money in the Russian budget because of the high prices of oil. And, of course, it is possible to find several billion of rubles for this particular purpose. Russia's vast mineral wealth has provided Putin with $38 billion to invest in the country. Its oil reserves are rumored to be the largest outside of Saudi Arabia, and it has a fifth of the world's natural gas. Russia's natural resources are giving it renewed political leverage as the world becomes dependent on it for its energy needs. But that future will surely be at risk if the government ignores the plight of so many of its people. The main problem is the absence of realistic demographic policy in our government. But it is a very serious danger. There will be a problem in the economy because there will be not enough labor force to work. There will be a problem in the uh, defense because there will be a great loss in the number of men who can have weapons in their hands. That, that is the problem of our military. Is that something the government is openly worried about? Yes, we tried to explain them this position for many years. And do you think now they started to... I hope it is so. The implications for the security of the country are beginning to hit home. This year, a Russian general complained that just 11% of conscripts were healthy enough for military duty. Now, for the first time in its history, the Russian army is having to pay people to join up. A weak Russia, a Russia of declining population might become an unstable Russia. You, you know, it needs a certain number of people to run its army, to keep its nuclear power plants ticking over, to manage its various industries. It's hard to imagine how, how it will exist if it fails to produce enough people to just reproduce the population that it takes to keep the country going.
To me, the frightening decline in the country's population seemed like a huge vote of no confidence in Russia's future. Months later, the government announced a 20-fold increase in aid spending. It seems to be realizing finally that the long-suffering Russian people are a resource it can't afford to squander. Are you personally confident that Russia will even survive into the next century? Uh, probably the Russia will survive, but the question is uh, what there will be population of Russia and what was the territory of Russia. And uh, we know a lot of examples from the history when the low birth rate comes to destruction of great powers. At the end of this journey, I understood that Russia is in an extraordinary state of flux. And it strikes me that the next few years are critical for Russia's future. I hope the government will use its new wealth wisely, not to chase the old epic dreams of empire, but for the mundane and vastly more important task of taking care of its people. In the state of Russia tomorrow, an obscure KGB official rises to the top. How did Putin come to power? That's tomorrow at nine. Tonight continues with amateur video footage and survivors' horrific accounts of a 57-hour siege. Terror in Moscow, next. <laughs>